I think it's really important to get different experiences in different types of companies, different sizes of companies, different types of roles so that you're prepared to take that step into executive leadership. Hi, everyone. It's Kara Golden from The Kara Golden Show, and I'm so thrilled to have our next guest here. We have Carrie Siggins, who is the CEO of Stone Age, and she's also the CEO of a subsidiary called Breadware, which we're going to hear a little bit more about. Carrie and I are both part of this group called YPO. I was actually on her podcast recently, so uh, it was a lot of fun talking to her about uh, my journey and my book Undaunted too. But I was, as I started to look a little bit more into Stone Age and kind of her journey, which is a lot of what we talk about on the Kara Golden Show. I really wanted to have her on to talk a little bit more about that, but just a little bit about Stone Age. They manufacture equipment used in the industrial cleaning industry, um, and we're going to let her talk a little bit more about breadware, too, and sort of what they're up to. Um, But Carrie has an incredible journey that she is willing to share before her time at Stone Age. uh, She battled a substance abuse challenge, um, which she's so brave to be able to share a little bit more about that and how she's able to take challenging times and turn that into lessons and facing her fears along the way and being able to use a lot of those learnings to grow and develop the team that she has today. Can't wait to hear her talk more about that. And like I said, she's just so inspiring and is the CEO of this incredible company based out of Colorado, uh, not too far from Durango. We were talking about that earlier. She got to go skiing this weekend. Very, very jealous. So, so welcome, Carrie. Very excited to have you here. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate that lovely intro. Absolutely. So for those listeners who aren't familiar with Stone Age, uh, share a little bit more about just about the company first. Probably people haven't heard about Stone Age, but everything you use, I can guarantee a Stone Age product has touched. So we basically make squirt guns on steroids and uh, and that's high pressure water jetting equipment used in uh, industrial cleaning. So our tooling and now robots uh, clean any kind of facility from refineries to chemical plants to food processing. So literally, quite literally, everything that you use comes from a facility that has to be cleaned. And we're the global leader in this type of equipment. So it is not a glamorous industry. I never expected to be uh, spending my career in industrial cleaning, but it's fascinating. It is an incredibly important aspect of uh, of manufacturing and processes that we use every day. And so I've had a lot of fun in, in this last 15 years on this journey. That's amazing. So let's go back to your childhood. So you, I mentioned you're based in Colorado. So did you grow up in Colorado? I did born and raised on the Western slope of Colorado. I spent my entire life trying to figure out how to get away from it. And then funny full circle, I'm back again. (laughs) You're back there. So tell us a little bit more about being raised in rural Colorado and, and maybe talk about your upbringing a little bit. I had a great upbringing. I, my mother was a single mother. My, my dad left when I was about four years old and he was in and out of our lives, but, but not around very much. And so my mom raised my brother and I literally like 15 miles outside of a small little town. We had three or four acres. We had horses. Like she'd have to go out and break the ice uh, in the in the horses' uh, uh, water trough in the winter. I mean, she's just this remarkable, amazing human being who worked two or three jobs. She put herself through college, um, and uh, when I was 12 years old, to get a communications degree so she could uh, so she could make a better life for herself. So I watched this whole time growing up. My mother really struggle to make ends meet, but just pure determination to provide for her family. 
And that was very motivating for me. Um, and, and maybe even in some unhealthy ways, like I just, I vowed I was never going to be like her. I didn't want to be in rural Colorado. I didn't want to be stuck, you know, breaking ice on a horse's tr water trough, you know, when I was 40 years old. And so, um, so, you know, I had this really inspiring uh, role model, but I also could not wait to get out of a small town. I just, I knew I was meant to do more. And, uh, and so I was always working hard to figure out how to get out of that small little town. <laughs> And so where did you go? So I went to Colorado School of Mines in Denver, Golden, uh, after I graduated. And, and that's an interesting story. So I've always been a wild, a wild child. I was always a boundary pusher. When I was 16, um, I got in a little bit of trouble with an older boy and uh, just making bad decisions. And my mom actually said to me, when you're 18, you are out of this house. I do not care if you work at Walmart for the rest of your life but you are not staying here. And I was shocked. I could not believe that she didn't think I was going to go to college. And she was like, what are you doing? It's going to make you go to college. You don't even go to school now. And so at that moment, I decided that's it. I'm going to prove everybody that um, I'm not a loser, that I, I'm smart enough to fulfill this dream that I have of leaving. So I buckled down. I decided I was going to go to School of Mines, uh, get an engineering degree, even though I wasn't 100% sure what an engineer did. And I was going to get a softball scholarship because my mom didn't have money to put me through college. And that's what I did. And I, uh, I made that happen. And uh, in 1997, when I graduated from Montrose High School, I headed to the big metropolitan of Denver and, uh, and started my, uh, my city life and my studies there. Oh, wow. And then yeah. were, so you graduated. Were you an engineer? Uh, I have an engineering degree, but I am not an engineer. In fact, okay. if you would ever drive on a bridge or something that I designed, you just shouldn't do that for fear of your own safety. <laughs> <laughs> I have no interest in design. I always was very good at math. Uh, and I love solving math problems, but about my junior year in high and at mines, I just knew that this wasn't what I was meant to, to do. So I actually studied, uh, um, business econ at the same time. So I, I did a dual degree while I was there, uh, and then graduated and, and had no idea what I was supposed to do with my life after, after that, yeah. <laughs> like most college, uh, most college graduates, totally. maybe not all, but that was me. I was lost. And did you leave Colorado? I did. So after I graduated, so I went to Mines, which is a difficult school, two degrees, playing softball and working in four years. All I did was grind it out. I mean, I literally just put my head down and it was a means to an end. In fact, I'm embarrassed to say, but I only remember like maybe a handful of people I went to college with. Like it was le legitimately just a means to an end. And what happened was um, I didn't know myself. All I was trying to do was prove that I could make it through mines. My dad actually had told me that he didn't think I was smart enough to, to graduate from engineering school. So I was determined to prove him wrong. I was really doing all of these things for other people to try to prove myself. And uh, after I graduated, I had no idea what I was going to do. Had an engineering job that I hated. And I actually, that's when I developed my, my, the beginning of my substance abuse issues. So I met this charismatic, uh, you know, rock star kind of guy in downtown Denver. And he was at all the parties and everybody knew him. And it was just this life that I didn't have growing up in rural Colorado and going to engineering school, you know, it's not very cool. And, uh, and so all of a sudden I was at the front of the line and all of a sudden everybody in the city knew who I was. And it really fueled this need to be seen and recognized that had been building up since my dad had left. Um, and yeah, I got myself into a pretty bad situation. So I decided at that time, this was about a year after I had graduated that, um, I needed to get out of Denver. And so I packed up my bags and I moved to Austin, Texas, no job, didn't know anybody there, but decided that that's how I needed to, to start over was to I don't know, move closer to the border. When you have a drug problem, you should always move closer to the border. It was not, not a great decision, but, um, but I got out of Denver and at least, you know, got through that bad relationship. And so you got to Austin and what was sort of, did you find a job once you got to Austin? Yeah, I did. I started, that's how I got into manufacturing operations. So I began working for Eaton Corporation, which is a huge manufacturing company. I worked in their electrical switchgear division and I ran all of the 
uh, field engineers. So there were about 30 engineers in the office and my boss was never there. Um, he had a substance abuse issue too, uh, uh, Oxycontin before that was a thing. And so I was basically running this office with influence, right? I didn't have a title. No one reported to me, but I, uh, I still had to keep things going, even though he was barely at work. So that's where I found my love for people management and for operations management and for engineering services, but all that same time, I didn't get over my substance abuse issues. So I was like leading this dual life of, you know, really developing a great career, but also living this, this life of this, of a self-destructive path, really going on down the self-destructive path of continuing to use drugs and, and living this kind of dual life. And how did you know that you had a problem? I mean, what was it? Because you were highly functioning, it sounds like, and you were, mm -hmm. you know, living your life and, and living in Austin, which sounds like a lot of fun. Um, lots of places to get in trouble probably yeah, as well. Right. And, uh, and so what was kind of the point when you just said, I got to do something here? Deep down inside, I always knew it was a problem. Um, it it's hard to hide that from yourself. And so, but I couldn't control it and I couldn't admit it. Um, and so it just progressively got worse. And you know, what actually pushed me over the edge was I decided, uh, this was the summer of 20 of 2006. I decided I was going to do a figure competition. So, you know, bodybuilding kind of thing. And I'm very muscular, very athletic. And I was like, I can do it. Well, when you have a drug issue and all of a sudden you are analyzing every single thing that you're putting in your mouth, um, it, 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 pushed me over the edge and, um, it was really self-destructive and I actually, uh, overdosed on labor day of 2006 because I wasn't eating and I was using drugs and, uh, and I just took it too far. And so it was at that point that I realized, all right, you have so much more potential in you. You can do more with your life. And I laid there on the floor of my apartment and I just evaluated the state of my relationships. Uh, and I just realized that I was this really selfish, self-centered human being who was doing all of these things for recognition, for this need to be seen as successful for a badass. And really I was a fraud and a fake and I couldn't go to work. And so that was it. That was when I decided I had to change my life and I was 27 years old. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, it must've taken, obviously it must've been a scary time for you trying to figure out, okay, how do I get back up? How do I, yeah. how do I share with my team, um, that this is going on with me? And, yeah. and so did you stay in Austin after no. you got out? So you left. So I left. So I nursed myself. So I could, there was no way I could, I could tell anybody what had happened. I was so ashamed. Um, while I was nursing myself through this. And it, it took me about three, three, four days before I could like actually, okay, I'm ready to face this. And I was just laying there in bed thinking about all the things I was going to change. So now I, I called a really good friend of mine who lived in Austin and told him everything. And then I called my mom and she's in rural Colorado. And I said, that's it. I, 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 I'm going to choose to live or I'm going to choose to die. And so I decided to uh, go back home to my roots and figure out how to um, rebuild my life into, into something that was a life worth living. That's amazing. So your mom, you're back with your mom. And what do you think you learned from that challenging time? I'm always, you know, sort of curious when I really think that no matter what the challenges are that you go through, if you start to look at, okay, what did I learn about myself? What things did I learn that could, I could actually do different or that I could enhance on those things so that I could be stronger in some way and, and teach others. I mean, what were some of the lessons that you learned from that? The biggest thing I learned is really how destructive imposter syndrome is. And I learned why I had it. So I started working with a life coach who introduced me to the Enneagram, which was exactly what I needed because it really helped me understand my style, which is an achiever and in these low levels of health drive you to 
very narcissistic behavior, self-destructive behavior so that you get the attention that you want. And I think it all stems from my father leaving and, and, you know, telling me all of these horrible things all of my life. I always just wanted to be seen. And so I learned the power of self-awareness and then how that self-awareness could actually help me get over trying to pretend to be somebody I wasn't. I just took it so far. Um, and of course, I'm really driven and being a high achiever, of course I did. Uh, but yeah, I think that's I think that's really the start of it. And then I knew that I had leadership qualities. I'd always been a leader um, in a leader position. My mom says I was, you know, came out of the womb as a leader. So then I started to really say, okay, how do I apply all of this that I've learned about self-awareness and self-forgiveness and imposter syndrome and become a kind of leader that people want to follow? And so that's really, you know, where I am right now today and why I talk about it so openly is that I think that people need to look inside and understand their triggers and their fears and, you know, the, the choices that they make so that they can choose to channel that into a positive way and change their lives. Totally. Well, I think I've heard it talked about as authentic leadership. And I yeah. think that there's different paths that people ultimately yeah. uh, go on to get there, but this is definitely a part of that. So you ended up getting a, a role, uh, not the CEO role, but a more junior role at Stone Age. So talk to me a little bit about that. I mean, you find out, was that your first job when you Got came back? back to Durango? Yeah. 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 I, it was my first job. Yeah. It was uh, first job when I got back to Durango. Uh, I have so much gratitude for the two founders who saw the potential in me and they had no idea of my story back then. They know it now. Um, but yeah, I applied for a general manager position. It was a manufacturing company, um, much, much smaller Eaton. I was running, you know, a hundred million dollar P and L at, you know, 24. And this is a little, you know, $8 million company. And I was like, well, I'm going to apply for it. And even though I'm underqualified, if I don't get it, uh, perhaps it's a foot in the door. And so the founders who also went to Colorado School of Mines um, decided that they saw something in me and the management team at the time said, we want to work for her, not these crusty old men who are going to you know, be boring and change the way we operate. Uh, so they decided to take a risk and hire me, but they brought me in as the director of operations. Um, and that way I had an opportunity to get my feet underneath me and learn the industry and, and really learn how to manage a, a bigger team. And then um, I was promoted to general manager a year after that, and then a year and a half after that into the CEO position. What did you learn? I mean, you had worked in larger companies. Like, what did you learn that you loved about kind of the entrepreneurial spirit? I mean, you didn't start Stone Age, but you, they were pretty tiny when you got there in comparison to sort of what you've grown this to be. I mean, what was yep. kind of, what did you feel like was different in terms of the environment? Oh, the ability to make an impact and make decisions. Um, that's huge. Working in Eaton, even though I had, uh, because of my role and because of the situation my boss was in, I definitely had access to people, people higher up in the organization, but they still didn't understand what it was like to really truly be with the customer. And I was always frustrated by that disconnect because it was like, Hey, we're here. We're the ones dealing with, with the, with the customers in the field. And you guys are making decisions that, that you have no idea how it's impacting your team, your boots on the ground. And so that's what I loved most about coming into a small company, a company that was very entrepreneurial um, spirited. We're an employee owned company. So everybody thinks and acts like owners. And I loved the ab ability to make a decision and see the impact that it had um, on the company, on my employees, on my customers, on my suppliers. It was so um, empowering and motivating from coming from a huge, huge corporation like Eaton. I bet to, to the people that were working inside of Stone Age that you had the ability to kind of explain how you could differentiate, right? Yeah. Especially in the sales process, but also to supplier, you know, anybody else that you guys were working with. I mean, to be able to have that kind of experience was probably super helpful. So you were elevated to the CEO role after three years, mm -hmm. uh, which is such a journey and a testament to you. And, uh, you know, here, 
as we just discussed, you you had the challenges, but you were able to overcome those and and really show up and work hard. And I'm sure it wasn't always easy, um, but also um, found people who you know really believed in you and saw your potential more than anything else. I read that your team has coined your style as Carrie's human engineering. So what does that mean to you? And what are some of the methods that you use for developing and empowering the team? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I would tell that little self-depreciating joke there about, you know, you don't want to drive on anything that I designed. Um, I'm not an engineer, but what I was really good at was being able to, um, I'm really good at getting people to tell me things mostly because I just ask questions. I'm deeply curious about humanity. So I would just ask a, a lot of questions and then I would say, Oh, you know what, this role would be suited better, better for you. And, and so I would make tweaks within the organization. And the next thing we knew we were having explosive growth and it wasn't because of so much of a, a of a strategy shift. Um, even though we did make a lot of business model changes, uh, even in those early days, it was mostly just getting people in the right places in the company to really um, excel, to align their roles with what they were good at. And so that's where they coined me with the human engineer. Well, you're, you're an engineer. You're just a human engineer. Uh, and so that's, that's where that came from. And I think my ability to grow uh, a team really comes from that curiosity and that desire to uh, help people find the right places um, within the company or even not with the company if it doesn't make sense to stay within Stone Age uh, for for developing your career the way you want to go. Um, it's really all about how do I help people get the best out of themselves and live the fulfilling life that they want, find purpose in their work. And that just takes getting to know people and asking questions and picking up on the, the cues and, and really thinking about organizational development from a strategic perspective. And, and that's how I, that's how I build the team. Did you walk into this company thinking that the CEOs were the founders, right? Yeah. Yeah. When you came in, did you walk in thinking that this was going to happen, that you were going to become the CEO. I mean, you were really looking for an opportunity to kind of start back up again. Right. But I think it, I mean, it's, it's pretty exciting that they saw that they were able to step away um, from the business and, and bring you in and uh, have you take it to the next level. So what would you share with people who are listening, who maybe think of that as like the dream opportunity. How do you find those opportunities where you're able to come in and really take a company to the next level? And I remember the conversation with uh, John Mogulma, uh, our, the founder who I reported to, and he was like, young lady, do you know that you don't even have any idea of the opportunity that you've been given? And, you know, like, okay, dad, because <laughs> he is the like, same age as my dad. I tease him about it all the time. Um, and, and I really didn't have any idea uh, of what it was going, of what it was going to turn into. So even though I'm not the founder, this is still my company. I still have complete control over the direction that we're going. And that is such an unusual thing for a hired gun to, to be in that situation. So, um, so yeah, it's really, it, it is a dream. It's amazing. I never thought it would happen. And the advice that I would give to people, um, who are looking for those types of opportunities. One, I think it's really important. And Kara, I know that you know this too. You know, I think it's really important to work in all different sizes of organizations, like working in, you know, a humongous uh, organization, you know, multi-billion dollar, um, you know, 40,000 employee organization really helped me understand like what it's like in corporate America. And then being able to go to some smaller, different types of companies and then come to Stone Age. Um, I'm glad I had that breadth of experience. At 28, when they hired me, there was no way that I would have been able to have to come in and be as impactful as I was without having that experience with Eaton. So I think it's really important to, um, to get different experiences in different types of companies, different sizes of companies, different types of roles so that you're prepared to take that step into executive leadership. And, uh, and then you want to work in an organization that believes in promoting from within, you know, I wouldn't have gotten that, that, 
general manager position, CEO position, if they didn't believe in developing people and hiring from within. So if you want to make that, that, that leap, I think it's really important to find companies who have the CEO from within type, um, or, or C level or VP, whatever that executive role you're looking for from within. Um, I think that's going to be the best way to achieve it unless you go out and start your own company. Yeah, definitely. But I also think that they probably saw early on your ability to really get to know people and want to know people as well. I think, you know, you were obviously a people person even before you got to Stone Age, but just wanting to understand how people ticked, right? Working inside of a large company, then going into a smaller company sometimes that would really freak people out, right? Right. That you're not going to have the same resources. Um, Things were just done differently, but there are people that really want to be much more hands-on and and also get to know um, all the different employees and and, uh, their different roles in the company. So I think, frankly, I think that is a great CEO, like somebody who can really go in and understand not only who the employees are and what makes them tick and what makes them want to grow and be at the company, but also how can you be helpful along the way? So obviously he saw this in front of him. Um, you were a godsend, I think, in, in many ways. So I think I think it goes in reverse too. How do you find people like Carrie to come into your organization? So as well, because it's, uh, it's timing more than anything else. Uh, yep. So Over the course of the last two years, we've seen a major technological shift from the rise of remote working to digitization. How has Stone Age really changed over the last couple of years? Yeah, so we're transitioning from being a manufacturing company to a tech company, uh, which is an interesting transition when you're taking a a 40 plus year old company and and really dramatically changing the business model. But I believe it's what companies have to do to stay relevant Mm -hmm. today. Uh, So, yeah, the, the very first tool that was ever developed was a water jet drill for uranium mining applications in the in the 70s. And we've expanded on that technology Uh, and really was always just focused on the tool that goes on the end of the hose. And now automation is taking over and there's just much safer, more efficient ways to do this work than a guy with his hands on a hose shoving a tool down a pipe, which is, you know, God forbid, still what they do in a lot of places. Uh, But yeah, we're really advancing technology, building robotic equipment. Um, I just bought a uh, IoT product development company, Breadware, you mentioned earlier. Uh, they we, they were a supplier of ours, a vendor of ours. They helped us develop some of that technology within our first IoT enabled product. And so our products now, you know, not only can do the work um, semi-autonomously and eventually autonomously, but they're also collecting data, giving the people doing the cleaning and all of these plants information on what's going on inside of their their production assets. So technology is 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 going to dramatically change the way industrial cleaning works, which needs to happen. It's a very old school, dangerous manual industry. And I think it's going to, um, it's dr- already dramatically changed Stone Age. Uh, and I think it's going to, it's going to really change the way the whole industry works and have a positive impact on all those types of facilities. Definitely. Have you gone more to remote working for a lot of your employees? Yeah. Or state yeah. remote? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, people have to be on site to do their jobs. They're here, uh, obviously manufacturing, um, production, shipping, receiving, things like that. Uh, and then we being employee owned, we treat people like adults. And so, uh, one of our values is, is practice self-leadership. And so we've really left it up to individuals and their teams to figure out what works best for them. Uh, so, in our headquarters here in Durango, it's where most of our employees are. People are coming in and out a day a week, two days a week. Some people are on the office five days a week, even though they can do their job from home. But we're trying to make it as flexible as we can so people That's can right. have autonomy and control over their own work. So yeah. you've already shared one story with us, but I'd love to see if you've got another story in you to share a challenge maybe and and growing Stone Age. And what did you take away from that experience that you can share that others might learn from? Oh God, so many things. (laughs) (laughs) So I think the, the biggest, most recent one 
uh, really came down to patent attorneys. So we are in a very technological industry. We've got over a hundred patents, you know, and the, 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 it's multiplied when you take all those patents and, and put them around the world. And so we are very protective of our patents and, uh, we've actually, uh, sued for, for infringement and have won. Um, and I got into a spat with a competitor, uh, over in Europe and I was so convinced I was right. I had been through several of these before and, uh, and I knew that the patent was weak. I knew exactly how we were going to beat it, but I had to do it in Europe. And so, um, and so they, they sued us for infringement. And I took us down this path and the CEO there tried to try to come up with a settlement, tried to come up with a licensing agreement. And I just said, no, um, I, I know I'm right. I know you're wrong. And, uh, and when we got to, you know, into the, into the lawsuit, it turns out that neither one of us had an airtight case. And so we wound up settling and I spent millions of dollars on this, um, all trying to prove that I was right. And this was a really tough pill to swallow because it's a competitor. Um, I had had convinced the board that this was the right way to go. And so, um, yeah, I was, I was filled with all kinds of anxiety, anxiety and shame that I let my ego get the best of me that I just didn't say what's the best thing for the company and, and settle it at the very beginning. I was scared to go to the board and say, Hey, we're going to have to settle. You know, here's the, the agreement that I negotiated with. I know I told you that we were going to win this and we didn't. So it just brought up like all of those things that demons that I had been working on for so long, um, front and center for me. So what I learned is one, don't let your ego, uh, get the best of you. Um, there's never anything that's black or white, especially in the world of patent litigation of any kind of litigation, really. And two, um, you know, how to face those decisions that you make that you think you're making the right ones in, in, in the moment. And you realize that, that it wasn't, and it doesn't mean that you hide it or pretend you didn't make it or minimize it. You just own it and you deal with the, the aftermath and, uh, and then move forward. So, and learn from it, right? I'm never going to make that mistake again, hopefully, (laughs) but it was a really, really painful one for sure. And it caused me lots of anxiety and worry that, you know, I was putting the company in a bad spot and that the board would be really upset with me and fire me. And, you know, all those stories you tell yourself, all of that went through my head. And how long ago was that? Oh, God, that all happened during the pandemic. We started it in 2019 and uh, was in 2020, 2020 was a year of hell. We had an encryption attack. So ransomware, um, we didn't have to pay the ransom, but I was down for four weeks. Then immediately into uh, the pandemic, all while battling this lawsuit in in uh, in Europe, which we did everything over Zoom and talking to a, a, a judge in a foreign you know, language and trying to do, ne- do negotiations and, you know, translations through the court system via Zoom. It was horrifying. It was so stressful. Wow. <laughs> such a wow. bad year. <laughs> such a cra- crazy time, but I'm glad yeah. that you're on the other end of it. So, and great lessons <laughs> to be learned. And so Breadware, tell me a little bit more about that. Oh, what a cool company. I'm so excited about Breadware. So Breadware is a product development company that helps people bring IoT products to life. And IoT, just for people who don't know, is Internet of Things. It's your your security camera system that you can, you know, alert you when something's going on and you can see from your your, home, your uh, phone. It's your it's Alexa, right? That's all IoT. And so uh, they are a consulting company who does engineering services and helps clients bring these products to life. And uh, what I'm really excited about is is not only the consulting services, but we're really transitioning them to a solutions as a service company uh, where they offer end-to-end, uh, end-to-end solutions for their clients, but ultimately where we'll develop our own IoT products. So we just bought a software company called Medium One, it's an IoT cloud platform. So basically an analytics, I'm sorry, basically a data visualization platform. It'll eventually do analytics so that you can, you know, easily start hook up your, your connected device and see the data that it's producing. 
Uh, we just came out with our first hardware product, which is called the Slice Board, which helps clients with speed to market to um, when they're developing their IoT product. And ultimately, I think out of all of this that we'll learn, we'll say, hey, here's a niche that we can actually come up with a solution. And um, instead of helping our clients develop it, that we come up with our own. So that's really where the five-year vision is going. I'm getting ready to hire a CEO to, to run it. Um, so I don't have to be the CEO of breadware too. Uh, and I'm really, really excited. I think we're going to scale it and grow it really fast and it diversifies what we're doing. And it's, uh, it's helping new technology come to market faster. That's awesome. What a great idea for sure. Yeah. So that's super, super great. Your own little entrepreneurial venture again. So it, you're going it totally back is. down to the bottom and uh, starting again. So I, I love that. Well, thank you so much, Carrie. It's been Truly inspirational having you on just to hear about your journey and uh, and where can people find out more about you and Stone Age? And I know you've got a book coming out next year as well. We're all really excited uh, to have a look at that and hear more about uh, so all the lessons that you've learned along the way. So tell us more where we can uh, hear about all that. Sure, sure. So social media, uh, LinkedIn is is where I do most of my posting, especially around my thought leadership on leadership and philosophy on, on some of the things that you heard about today, uh, Carrie Siggins. Uh, my website, carriesiggins.com. Uh, I have, you know, Instagram, all of that stuff, but LinkedIn, LinkedIn and my website's the best place. Um, Stone Age is uh, stoneagetools.com and Breadware is breadware.com and, uh, and love to you know, reach out. I would love to hear from you. And yes, my book is coming out next year. Uh, I'm still debating on the title right now. So no titles uh, to be revealed, but uh, it's all about my leadership philosophy and sharing some of this journey and the things that I've learned about flaws and admitting those flaws and using them to power you to make, um, to become a better leader. So, uh, reach out anytime. So great. Well, thank you for coming on and thanks everybody for listening and please subscribe to the Kara Golden show so that you're able to not miss out on all of these amazing people who I have coming on, uh, people like, Carrie and so many others. And please be sure to send in those five star reviews as well for this episode and all episodes uh, that you're able to listen to. It really helps in the algorithm. And find me on all social channels at Kara Golden. And don't forget to pick up a copy of my book, Undaunted, where you can hear about my journey. And we are here every Monday and Wednesday. And I believe actually adding another day um, coming soon soon, very, very soon. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to hear from you and uh, hear other guests that you think that we should be interviewing as well. People like Carrie, as I said, but also entrepreneurs, CEOs, founders, and just incredible people that are doing great things that we can all learn from. So thanks everyone. Have a great rest of the week. Thanks, Carrie.